Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming on this very warm evening. And it's sort of warm in here, so I excuse that. But it's cooler in here than it is outside. My name is Maeve Clark, and I'm Information Services Coordinator here at the Iowa City Public Library. And this is our first presentation here at the library for our um, Eco Iowa City in Denver. And I don't know if you're aware of Eco Iowa City, but it's a grant that the Iowa City Public Library got with the um, Iowa City Landfill. And Jennifer Jordan is here. She's part of our grant team. And sitting next to her is Hannah Fleck, who is our intern. And um, you'll be seeing the three of us doing lots and lots of activities for Eco Iowa City. In fact, we've already had a couple of initiatives. We were at a couple of farmers markets, and we were giving away compost coupon so you could get a free dollar's worth of compost post which is 200 pounds and you can still get compost you just don't can't get a free 200 pounds but it's very very um, economical what is it a ten dollars a ton so it's an excellent price you get that at the landfill um, we also were at um, the project green plant fair and we gave away seeds from seed savers and we have a couple of events coming up. We have this event tonight, and then, although it doesn't sound terribly inviting right now, on Saturday, we have two opportunities for you, either at 9 o'clock in the morning or at 11 o'clock in the morning, to take a tour of the, land po the landfill and the compost facility out at the um, landfill. And we would like you to register for that, and you can do that at any of the public service desks. So tonight, if you're interested in that, if you go to the fiction desk or upstairs to the second floor, you can register. And there are lots of spaces left to do that. Um, it'll be really, really interesting. So it won't be Jen, but it'll be um, someone else who works at the landfill. And you'll get to see the landfill and the compost facility. And then it will end at the salvage barn. And the salvage barn is um, run by the Friends of Historic Preservation, and that's another partner in Eco Iowa City. So back to our grant. So we received a grant from the International City and County Management Association to show that uh, a library could work with another city department, and Jen and I have had a relationship in recycling for a long time, so we thought, oh, let's try and get, get a grant. So we applied for a grant, and we waited and waited to hear, and it turned out that there were 515 other libraries in the United States that applied for this grant, and nine libraries received it. So we consider ourselves very, very lucky in getting this grant. And we have lots of things that we're going to do. It not only has to do with urban composting and local food, that's sort of our thrust for the summer and this last spring, but we'll be doing initiatives on energy conservation. And those will be things in the fall we hope to have um, make available to the public winterization kits that will help you winterize your home and then have some programs that have to do with making your home more energy efficient. We'll also be doing urban stormwater management, which is probably not the sexiest title, but that will be next spring and summer. And that's a whole um, initiative that has to do with rain barrels and rain gardens. And so we'll have some um, things that we'll talk about later through the grant. But that will include an, an, a subsidy to buy a rain barrel and then lots of things that have to do with that. And then we have some smart waste disposal activities that you'll be hearing about. And one of those that we think is really exciting is a pharmaceutical collection, because that's a real problem in many areas, including Iowa City, is what you do with your expired drugs. So those are some of the things that are will be coming up. But so kicking off this urban composting, we have a program tonight. But we also have something that I think is really exciting, and that's a compost bin subsidy. So starting this Saturday at Restore, and um, there were some handouts if you didn't get a handout. We can, oops, get you the information. Oh, sorry, just a second. But we will for, make available for $25 a earth mover compost bin, which is a fantastic price. Jen did a great job in negotiating with the people who sell these things to get a, a wonderful price. And then we were able to subsidize it with our grant to bring the cost down to only $25. So if you're interested in that what you need to do is go to the Restore building. That's the East Side Recycling Center on two, Saturday morning starting at 10 o'clock. Have your $25 available and pick up your bin. Now, because the grant was written for um, Iowa City in particular, we're only making the bins available to Iowa City residents until August 1st. And then after August 1st, if there are more, 
um, anyone else will be eligible for them. And it is limited to one bin per household because there are only 100 of them and we want to get them to as many people as possible. Just another thing I'd like to point out before I turn this program over is we have lots and lots of partners in our Eco Iowa City initiative and um, Farmers Market, Environmental Film Festival, Project Green, Restore, Rummage in the Ramp, that's going to be coming up at the end of July and you'll be hearing a lot about that throughout um, local media. <coughs> I Renew is a partner, Backyard Abundance, and Backyard Abundance is doing something on Saturday. So you can have a really full day on Saturday. You can start at 9 o'clock in the morning, go into the landfill, taking a tour, come picking up your compost bin, and then in the afternoon, you can go to the Backyard Abundance tour, and that's from 3 to 5 o'clock, and there's information on our website about that. And Johnson County Heritage Trust is also a partner, and we're adding partners all the time. But tonight, we're talking about composting, and our presenter is um, Risa Dotson Ike. And Risa is originally from Iowa. She lived in Eugene, Oregon for six years where she became, and this is a really interesting thing that I don't think occurs yet in Iowa, but we hope it will. She was a master recycler. Maybe she'll talk to us about that. She lived in Lane County. As a recycler, she created a video on backyard composting for the Oregon State Extension Office. After returning to Iowa in 2006, Risa went through the Master Gardeners program at the Iowa State Extension, and she's now a Master Gardener intern. And the Master Gardeners are our partners as well. We just don't have a logo for them yet. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Risa. And we will have time for questions afterwards, or do you want to take questions throughout it? After. After, OK. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate you being here. Pull this up. Okay. If you have questions later about composting or the Master Recycler Program or the Master Gardener Program, I can talk about any of those. I think we've got plenty of time afterwards for questions, so think about them. Um, like she said, my name is Risa, and I lived in Oregon as a master, I was a certified master recycler, and uh, it's basically you go through a course learning how to reduce waste from the landfill. So the county put it on um, encouraging us to learn and educate the community on how to keep the waste out of the landfill. And um, a big part of that is composting, which is why I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, some of you might not have composted before. I know before I moved to Oregon, I really didn't know what composting was. The only reason I started was because I happened to have a compost bin in my backyard, so I learned how to do it. So, um, but you might have composted without even realizing it. If you have a pile of leaves in your yard, a pile of twigs in your yard, that's a form of composting, although it's really slow. Um, it is a form, so I can tell you how, how to do it a little bit better. And uh, I'm going to go over quite a few things tonight. First of all, why you should be composting, what compost is, how compost happens, get into the science of it a little bit, uh, different methods for composting. I brought a few collection containers I can talk to you about. Also compost bins, that's one of a variety of compost bins you can use. And uh, just a few things on what's happening in compost today that I'm aware of. So first of all, why should we compost if it's not obvious? Um, because it's a great way to reduce the amount of waste going from your home to the landfill, and it's a great way to make great quality soil in your own backyard. An idea of how much we could be composting that we're not is in these garbage trucks. These are the trucks that come to your um, curb every week and pick up your garbage. On average, how many of these are hauling away material that could be composted? 34%. So that just gives you kind of a visual of how much we could be diverting. Um, it's, this is nothing new. Before the 20th century, waste was either burned or le left to decompose or used as fertilizer, um, et cetera. But cities grew, landfills were developed, and we've all kind of gotten in the habit of, it's just easy to throw it away and have these trucks hauled away. But we can do something a little bit more earth friendly. As the US, I'm sure you've all heard this quote, we're 6% of the world's population and we produce 25% of the world's waste. So we can do something about that. 
Um, a lot of people are also under the misconception that when you put your waste in the landfill, it will decompose. It, if you put a carrot in your landfill, it's going to mix with all the other garbage in there and it's just going to decompose into the ground. Well, typically that's not true in a lot of landfills across the country. A lot of them are doing a dry tomb style, which keeps the garbage from leaching down into the groundwater. So the stuff in the landfill isn't really decomposing. I've heard of landfills that were in the style that got dug into after 50 years and they could still break a carrot in half. The stuff is not decomposing, so don't let, don't let that misconstrue, <laughs> um, misconstrue you. It's really good to just keep that stuff out of the landfill because once you put that, they, I mean, they compress it, but it's just good to keep it out of the landfill um, because they're expensive. They use valuable land space and they're expensive to maintain, et cetera. I won't go on and on about it. <laughs> um, another way of looking at it is the average household garbage, household garbage can in your house, um, not in your house, not in my house, but average across the US, Typically, it's about a third trash, a third recyclable materials, and a third compostable materials. This has gotten a little bit better in the past few years as people are recycling more with curbside pickup, but a lot of the compostable materials are still getting thrown away. So you can see that if you start to compost and recycle a lot, you're going to have only a third of your trash can full. So it makes quite a bit of difference. Um, recycling is good. A lot of people are doing it. It's a great thing to do. I have nothing against recycling. But I have to say the negatives. It requires energy to convert the recyclables to new products. And it creates energy for the trucks to haul them away, come to your house, pick it up, haul them away. Composting, however, is the most environmentally friendly way of recycling because it never has to leave your yard. You can take your food, throw it in your bin, yeah. carry it out to your compost, let it do its thing, use it in your garden, eat your food, it never has to leave. So the only energy being used is you and maybe your tools, and that's it. So it's a really great environmentally friendly thing. Um, not only does compost divert waste from the landfill, it also creates a wonderful uh, soil for your yard that you can use. This is a, sort of the loop that I like to show, uh, the sustainability of it all, kind of shows you how it happens here at the top, they're picking apples, they're breaking their leaves and eating their veggies, throwing them into their compost pile. And then the earthworms and the pill bugs and the fungi and bacteria are all breaking it down, turning it into soil that then they're using to regrow it. So it's just this wonderful loop system happening in your own, in your own yard. And composting, of course, is good whether you use it or whether you let it sit, whether you give it to a friend, give it to a community garden, whatever you want to do with it. If you're composting, you're doing a good thing. So now that I've talked it up, how does compost happen? You need four things to have a successful pile. Air, water, nitrogen, and carbon. All organic material has carbon and nitrogen in it. And this is the part that I get into a little bit of science, but I would, I'll try not to overwhelm you. Nitrogen is the green material sort of the wet stuff. It's uh, used to build protein, cell structure, and genetic material. The examples of green listed here are grass clippings, food waste, manure, and coffee grounds. Carbon is the brown material, sort of the dry material. It's the building block of life. Organisms use carbon for energy. You all know carbs are energy, right? Uh, examples of browns are shredded paper, leaves, sawdust, paper towels, also coffee filters, napkins, anything really made from tree. Um, if you have too many browns in your pile, like I mentioned earlier, the twigs, the uh, leaves in the pile, it'll decompose really slowly. And if you have too many greens in your pile, like you might have had a pile of grass clippings or something, it'll start to stink after a while. So. What you need to do is have, try to get a carbon to nitrogen ratio. The ideal for it to break down perfectly is 30 to 1. I don't expect you all to go out and do it perfectly, but that's what, sort of what you're aiming for. The reason for the 30 to 1 ratio is that microorganisms use 30 parts carbon for every part of nitrogen they consume. 
So when it's at that optimal ratio, then they're breaking it down at the optimal point. And like I said, everything has carbon and nitrogen in it. So what we're calling nitrogen is less than a 30 to 1 ratio, and what we're calling carbon is more than the 30 to 1 ratio, and usually by quite a bit. For example, veggies and grass are about a 12 to 1 ratio, and sawdust is a 500 to 1 ratio. Um, that's sort of the extreme on that end. But uh, the closest to the middle that I've found is coffee, which is 25 to 1. And um, coffee is awesome in compost, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more later because I love coffee and compost. <laughs> uh, manure also is, I don't believe, as close as coffee, but close to that 30 to 1. So uh, air and water, why are they important? Air is important in the compost pile because aerobic bacteria uh, reproduce in the presence of oxygen. That's the good stuff. Without air, anaerobic bacteria, that's the bad stuff, they reproduce and give off the alcohols and sulfurs that cause the compost piles to smell bad. So aerobic bacteria, good. Anaerobic, bad. Uh, the compost pile will need some water for the beneficial bacteria to survive, but not too much. It should feel about as damp as a wrung out sponge. You might need to add water if it's looking too dry or add uh, paper or cardboard if it's looking too wet to kind of soak up that extra moisture. Also, worms really like the uh, wrung out sponge sort of consistency. You know, if it rains kind of heavily, they all leave the ground and go to the sidewalks. That's why it's too wet on the ground. So now we're going to talk about coffee. Coffee grounds and manure. Um, if you live on a farm and have chickens or manure from other animals, you might want to consider using it. I just don't have, I don't have manure at my house to use in the compost, uh, so I use coffee grounds. Um, but they're both great additions to the backyard compost piles uh, because they provide that great ratio and they're a great food source for the beneficial bacteria. And the massive reproduction of the beneficial bacteria is what causes the pile to heat up and decompose at a faster rate. So um, I, don't, I drink coffee pretty regularly, uh, but not enough to use in my backyard compost pile. So what I do is I, well, I'm going to show you these later, but this one I take to work and I just bring the coffee home from work in that. And uh, that's sort of how I get that in my pile. But um, I believe there are some places around town that you can get coffee. Uh, some of the coffee shops, possibly New Pie. I've heard of people just you know, taking in a container and asking them to put their coffee grounds in them. Um, because I think a lot of the coffee shops are aware that this is a really great thing for compost piles. And uh, you know, better to, than just th throw them away. So um, you can look around for that. Another thing is when I lived in Oregon, and I believe there's other cities around the country that do this, uh, five of the coffee shops when I was there had garbage cans outside that just said, um, no garbage, compost only, and the coffee shops would fill up their garbage bags full of coffee grounds, take them out there, and then the composters would just come and pick them up. And I visited five in one day, and I think three of them had bags, the other, one, the other ones had already been taken. So it's a really popular thing to do, and I think a lot more coffee shops are becoming aware of it, and that's a great way to get just, you know, a lot of coffee if you want to get your, pot, your compost pile heated up and going. Something to think about. So we all know that co uh, coffee and fruit and veggie waste and leaves and shredded paper are all great for making compost, but what isn't great is cheese, dairy products, milk, meat, uh, also grease and oil, um, pet waste, dog and cat waste, uh, human waste you don't want to put in there, primarily because all of those things attract rodents, pests to your yard, and they cause odors. They're slow to decompose, so they would stink for a while. You don't, your neighbors would complain. You don't want to do it. A um, couple other things to keep out, black walnut leaves. Uh, pretty much anything from the black walnut tree keep out. Uh, it's got toxins and weeds. Um, a lot of people aren't going to get their backyard compost pile hot enough to kill off weeds and diseased plants. So you, basically anything you don't want to go in your garden, keep out of the compost pile. There are several different ways to compost. This is just three, three of the more popular kinds, uh, cold composting being the most popular kind. It is the kind that I've always done. 
Um, it's the kind that you do if you don't have a lot of time, if uh, you don't want to devote every day to composting sort of thing. It's also called the dump and run method because you basically dump your stuff in and well, you might walk away, but they call it the dump and run method. Um, well, it's easy. You just throw your stuff in there. If it starts to stink, you deal with it. If it's not working, you deal with it. Um, and it basically, the only thing you have to remember is to keep about a 50-50 balance of carbon to nitrogen ratio in your, in your compost bin. So like at my house, I have a lot of veggies from the farmer's market right now. I do a CSA. Everything going in there is pretty much veggies. And so I don't have a lot of brown material. I don't use paper towels or napkins at my house. So I bring coffee filters and paper towels from work, but it's not quite enough. So I keep a garbage can full of dry leaves next to my bin that I just, when it starts to look a little bit wet, I throw the dry leaves in there and it keeps the odor down. Also, coffee keeps the odor down. But, uh, so just try to keep an eye on it. Just generally keep that mix of, of the greens and the browns 50-50. And it's a really easy thing to do. There you go. Um, the problems with that is that it is a lot slower. It can take up to a year, sometimes longer. If you really want to use your compost right away, you might want to be more active in trying to get it moving. And I can get it. That's hot composting. Um, it also doesn't get hot enough to kill seeds or weeds or disease debris. Um, and it relies on worms to come up and process all the eat all the food basically and digest it and it sort of freezes and stops in the winter obviously so all the worms leave and it's not doing anything over the winter. But it does rapidly thaw in the spring when it goes through that freeze thaw cycle it really starts to break down. Um, oh and it grows veggies. My compost pile has all sorts of uh, squash plants and everything growing out of it right now. <laughs> um, you can combat that by stirring it often but as the Lazy method, you don't have to stir it that often. So, you know, however much attention you want to give it. Hot composting does require more attention. Um, you want to get it up to a certain temperature and hold it at that temperature for long enough that it will kill those weeds and disease and, and really decompose the material a lot faster. So, and you can, it can be ready to use in three months. I've heard of crazy people that were able to do it in just a couple of weeks. <laughs> which is really difficult to do, but, uh, but it can be done. And uh, hot composting is too hot for worms, so it relies on bacteria and fungi to break it down. And um, I've heard different numbers on this, but what I've got here is if the pile holds a temperature of between 130 and 160 for three to five days, it, can, um, it will decompose very quickly, but sometimes it, it'll need to go about two weeks to really kill off that stuff and get breaking, broken down. I believe the landfill holds it at, I got this from the paper, uh, 132 for two weeks. All right, I'm getting the thumbs up. <laughs> um, and that's what kills the weeds and, uh, and makes it great compost. So you can do that too. It might take some practice. Don't expect to get a successful hot pile the first time you try. That's just my advice. Um, this is my recipe for your hot compost. You want two parts greens, the wet nitrogen, banana peels, fruits, veggies, grass clippings, uh, tomatoes, a mixture of it is good. One part coffee or manure, the dry nitrogen, because it's closer to the middle, and one part browns, the dry carbon, which is you know shredded leaves or paper towels, coffee filters. Um, and the best way to do this is, okay, I've seen this done, you get a couple of friends and four five gallon buckets and you fill up two five gallon buckets with banana peels and tomatoes for example and one five gallon bucket uh, completely coffee grounds and then one five gallon bucket is shredded leaves shredded up really good and you get a great big tarp and you dump all the buckets in the middle of the tarp and you have everybody pick it up and shake it around really good and then you take it over to your bin right here and you dump it in and then you uh, and it's all stirred up then really well throw some leaves on top to discourage the flies and uh, you should ideally have the perfect setup for your hot compost. Whether it works or not, <laughs> I can't guarantee, but that is uh, the method that I've seen people do and it, and it does usually work pretty well. Um, you can stick a 
thermometer in there and keep an eye on the temperature to make sure it is working properly too. And uh, you want to stir it also a lot more often if you're doing a hot compost pile. And you want to have a minimum of one cubic yard for it to decompose properly, which is three by three by three feet. The other kind is sheet mulch composting. Um, this isn't quite as popular, and I have to tell you, I have tried it, and I have failed at it. Um, I could tell you my experience later, but uh, first I'll kind of give you an idea of what it is. So you lay down on the ground um, newspaper and cardboard, and then on top of that, about a two to four inch layer of greens, either grass clippings or fruit and veggie waste. On top of that, a layer of manure or coffee grounds, and on the very top, a layer of shredded leaves. And the idea is that the air then will filter down through the leaves and break the material down. It's all set up. You do it right where you're going to have your garden so you don't have to move anything around. And then after a season, it's decomposed all down to compost soil and you don't have to, it's all just sitting right there where you're going to garden. And ideally, you don't have to do anything. It's all ready to go. So I tried this because we were going to put a garden um, right in the only sunny spot in the yard where the cable and electric line go right through the middle of it, so we couldn't till at all. And uh, I put down a bunch of pizza boxes and other cardboard boxes, and all the grass I mowed all last summer went on top of that. And then I skipped the coffee step because I never did make it to the coffee shop to get any. And then I just, oh, all the uh, apples and pears that fell off my trees, I, I threw that on top of it too. And then all the leaves I raked in the fall, I threw that on top of it. And it was this great big heap, and it looked great. And then throughout the winter, it snowed. It got covered in snow. It was a big mound. And as the winter went on, it slowly got smaller and smaller and smaller. Until the spring, it was pretty much level with the ground. So I was really excited, and I went over to check it out and see how it worked. And uh, it was basically a layer of dry leaves. And underneath that, about that far, was completely wet leaves, soggy, uh, mushy pears and apples. And all the cardboard was completely gone and disintegrated. What I did after I went back and re-looked over my notes, I put way too many greens in there. I had way too much nitrogen in that pile and it stunk. And I, you know, I didn't do the coffee. I didn't do enough browns. I just, I didn't do a two to four inch layer of greens. I did a, a really big layer of greens. So um, I'm, I will try it again. I'm dedicated to it. I know it's going to work someday, but I encourage you all to go try it yourself. And uh, you know, you learn from your mistakes. So uh, next I want to show you the collection containers that I brought here. This is the one that I have at home. Um, I think you might have seen it before. It's kind of a popular <coughs> style. It's stainless steel and it's a little bit big, but the great thing is it's, it's got filters in the lid so it keeps the smell in. I used to use stuff like this in my kitchen, um, which is good. It encourages you to empty it a lot more because it starts to stink. <laughs> You can smell it. That lid doesn't keep the smell out. But this lid has two filters in it and, uh, and holes in the top to breathe. And I've had stuff in there that went moldy and for, for a couple weeks. I opened it and ooh, it's awful. But it, it really holds that smell in. So that's the good thing about it. Bad thing is you don't empty it as often because it doesn't smell. Uh, this one, I take this one to work. It fits great underneath the coffee pot at work. It doesn't look pretty. It's kind of nasty. but. Um, if you want, this one you, you can wash, both of them you can wash with soapy hot water. They come clean. I usually just rinse this one and it's pretty old. Um, you can also bleach them. Sometimes I'll throw some water and bleach in there just to get the smell out. And uh, this one is actually one from uh, the city of Eugene that when they started doing um, curbside yard, or curbside uh, food pickup like they do the yard waste pickup. And a couple cities are doing that, and I'm, I'll get into that a little bit more later. But it's a little bit bigger. It's got a snap-on lid, um, and it's quite a bit bigger. There's a paper towel in there. Um, I did take that to work previously when I worked at a much bigger job. There was a lot more coffee and stuff. So that was a great one. It comes with a handle. And people really liked using that one. So, But I've seen people uh, throw their compost from the kitchen into a wide variety of things. If you know, if you're going to dump it that night, you might as well just throw it in a bowl or a container that you've emptied and, and then just go out and dump it when you're doing your dishes. Um, if you're not, if you have a, 
a lot of food if you've got a family of 10 and you all eat vegetables all the time. Five gallon bucket under the sink, you know, however you want to do it. Whatever works for you, you can do the collection container. Now I want to show you a few different compost bins. Of course, there's the earth machine, but there's a few other types. This is sort of the type, I didn't have the open door, but when I uh, first started composting, there was a compost bin in my backyard, and it looked like this, um, just wooden, square. Pretty simple, pretty easy to deal with. The problem with it was, um, you add this stuff to the top, and it didn't have the door that opened, so you had to really push the stuff to the side to get down to the finished compost on the bottom, and it was difficult to to get that finished compost out without you know, getting some of the food and stuff in it. So this is my compost system now. Um, my husband built this a couple of years ago when we moved into our new house. Um, it is, this picture was taken yesterday, by the way. Uh, it's got the two different, it's like the, the previous picture, but it's got two different sections. And the idea is that right now I'm adding compost to one side, letting the other side sit. So that after that, and it's because it's the cold compost method, it takes a while. So, you know, after a year or maybe two years, then I'll go and use the finished compost and just switch them, let the other one sit, and then add to that first one. Also, um, it opens, so you can really get to it. And you can, I don't know how well you can see this, but, um, well, you can see the stuff, the squash plants and everything growing on the top of it, like I told you. Um, but the stuff on the bottom is really nice and dark brown. That's the stuff that's starting to get finished. Stuff on the top is all the stuff I've been adding to it. So that's sort of how it works. All the stuff on the top, you know, as it, as it decomposes, the worms are coming up from underneath and going through all the food on the bottom and working their way up to the top. So that's how they, that's how they work. And there's lots of other animals in there besides um, worms. No, I shouldn't say animals. <laughs> Insects and pill bugs and all the beneficial things that you want in there that are eating all that food, doing a good job. In this previous picture, too, I forgot to show you, that's the garbage can that's full of leaves sitting right there so that I can just throw it right in. And these are all pallets that we picked up in town. So it's sort of a more affordable way of doing it. And we lined it with chicken wire on the inside so that the food doesn't fall through the holes. The holes um, are important to have, too, to get that air in there. And also when it rains like it's been raining, they drains the rain a lot faster with those holes. Um, this is another style that is basically just the chicken wire with some poles. Um, this one's sort of difficult to get to the bottom of also. I've seen these. Usually they just have leaves in them and dry brown material in them. Not a lot of food waste. Um, but they do break down really slowly and the best way to get to that finished stuff is I think to move it or to take it apart. But that's an affordable method. This is sort of a more fancier kind, um, a little bit more expensive. It's all plastic. It's got a lot of air holes on the side. It's got the lid. And, um, but each one of these compartments you can take apart. So you can make it smaller. You can make it bigger. You can take half of it off to get to the bottom part of it easier without having to reach in there. So um, a lot of different things you can do with this one. And uh, you might have seen these. These are pretty big. I think they stand about this tall. And the idea is that um, instead of stirring your compost with your tools and using your muscles, you just take this one and twist it and it tumbles all the stuff inside. So it's a really great idea and it sounds wonderful, but if you get, get it more than half full, it can become really difficult to turn it. And um, unless you're a muscular person, uh, you know, it's just you can't really push it without help from a friend or two. So that's sort of the downside of this one. And this is the earth machine, which we've got over here. Um, the earth machine, it's, got, it's good for a few ways. I want to point out why this is a good choice. Um, also, people that use them typically don't call them earth machines. They call them Darth Vader's. So <laughs> that's what I asked what she was getting. I said, oh, it's a Darth Vader. Um, it's got a lid, so if it rains a lot, it'll keep the rain out, and so it won't get over wet. It's also open on the bottom, so it drains, um, and the worms can come up into it and, you know, do their thing, and then in the, when it starts to get cold and the worms go back down into the ground, so you're not killing your worms, which is great. Um, it's got lots of air holes, so there's lots of room for air movement, and when you add, oh, and it locks, 
and twist it and it'll lock uh, so then rodents don't get into it. Um, when you add your stuff on the top, all the finished stuff goes to the bottom like I was showing you before and it's got this nice little thing here that you pull up and then you can get to your finished compost on the bottom without having to go through that new stuff on the top. So it's really set up pretty well for that. Also the top part comes out if you do need to get in there and if you can't stir it well or you need to get down to the bottom, you can take off the top part and get to that stuff on the bottom. So, and it's black, so it heats up faster on the warm summer days, um, like today. By the way, composting today is not considered hot composting. Sorry. It's not 130 degrees. I know it feels like it, but it's not. <laughs> but typically, uh, I have a thermometer in my compost. A lot of times, the compost pile is about the same temperature as the air, so if it's cold, if it's cold compost. Um, What's happening with compost today? Um, a few different things I wanted to share with you that I know about happening uh, that are great things are uh, basically the education of it. I visited, when I was in Oregon, I visited a elementary school that was doing something called the School Garden Project. And their elementary land had a garden and a compost section. And they had a program with second and third graders involved in this compost and if you want to teach second and third graders about science and about dirt you don't really have to work that hard it's that's fun education for them so they were really loving it and uh, they were using the material from their cafeteria and bringing it out to their compost they had a nice covered compost bin it rains a lot there so um, and the I, I was out there with kids, they were sticking their hands in it and feeling how hot it was and just having a great time. So um, I would really, it's great that they're doing that program, I would love to see that program uh, become more popular, educating children about how compost works and how it's a, you know, a great way to return the, the food into becoming more food. Uh, another thing is curbside yard waste and food waste pickup. A lot more communities in the last, you know, five, ten years have started doing the yard waste pickup. And uh, a few of the bigger cities are now doing curbside uh, food waste pickup, which is what this was from. And basically they're just asking you to put, they're trying to educate the community of what is compostable. It says right on here um, what you can put and can't put. Uh, basically, like I said before, no meat and oil or grease, but it also says plastic bags, glass, metal, foil, styrofoam, diapers. I mean, you have to get a lot more specific <laughs> for, for the community. Um, and then it says acceptable items, fruit, bread, coffee, tea bags, nuts, that sort of thing. So um, it's a, that's a program that's becoming more popular. We may see it in Iowa City someday. I encourage you all to um, educate all your neighbors and friends about it and uh, see if we can't get the community more excited about composting. And uh, of course, programs like Eco Iowa City are doing programs like this one tonight, trying to do just that, educate the community and um, teach everybody everything they want to know about composting, get you excited about going out and doing it. So that's why we're here. Um, this is my garden. This was taken yesterday. I, um, this is the sheet mulch failure garden. So then what I did, because I couldn't till, I built a, or sorry, my husband built a raised bed garden. And um, everything in there, 100% of that dirt is from the landfill. That's the topsoil compost stuff that you get for, um, what was that again? $10 a ton. $10 a ton. And I didn't, that might be a ton in there. We've got more, we bought more than a ton that day. We didn't use it all. but. Um, we filled it up and it's been working great. I had a little bit of a carrot explosion happen, you can see. But um, it's really great. It was very hot when we brought it home. It was still steaming. Waited 24 hours before we planted anything because it was very, very hot. But, um, but it's some really great stuff. And the only weeds that have gotten into that are maple, from the maple tree that my neighbors have. So no weeds coming out of that landfill stuff. This is my email address. It might be on some of those handouts that were handed out. Uh, 
Also, the library has a ton of materials on composting, but if you have a question that maybe you can't find at the library, or if you just want to challenge me, I love a challenge. I will go look in my five binders at home and try to answer your questions. So I encourage you to send me an email. And I'd like to open it up for questions. Yes. Oh, sorry. sorry. I have a question. Uh, the question that I have is just basically, um, why can you put manure in it, but you can't put uh, pet waste? OK, uh, pet waste, and it's, um, it depends on your pet, but they specifically say cat and dog waste. Uh, I believe it has a lot to do with the fact that cats and dogs eat meat. Um, also human waste. Uh, it's also, um, it basically, it smells. It's going to attract, it decomposes slow, it's going to attract pests to your yard, and it's going to break down really slow, it's going to smell really bad. Oh, but it does. does, it does decompose. Okay. Okay, and then if you're in the farm, if you want to bury it, you know, you don't have neighbors, you don't, you're not worried about pests, you feel free to experiment. <laughs> okay. The other one that I had was about, can you put too much coffee ground in? I mean, because you were saying about you couldn't get enough coffee ground. Not in. that I know of. Oh, okay. um, I mean, you'd have to, you have to let it break down, but, and you'd have to mix it with, you, it, but you can throw just coffee in your uh, plants too. I mean, that's, that's been coffee and tea. You can throw it in your plants without it even composting and it does okay. Um, but it's good to, to mix it with vegetables and, and some dry browns um, just to get it to break down before you add it. What about paper towels? You mentioned that, but just any of your paper towels that you're done with, maybe that don't have ink or color in them? Or? I, I compost with all paper towels. If, okay, if you had a really greasy pizza on it, you might not want to. Um, you can. That's not really a lot of grease um, because that grease is going to attract pests. And if you don't have very much of it, it's no big deal. If you have a little bit of grease, it's okay. But, um, and oil is the same, you know, like olive oil and stuff like that. But um, paper towels, if they're, you know, a lot of them are bleached and they've got little patterns of chickens and things on them and flowers, uh, it's up to you. I, I compost with them. The amount of ink on those is so minimal. By the time that it's done decomposing, and it's turned into, and it's gone through the worm, you know, and all the bacteria, whatever, that eats it up, it's going to have such a little amount in there that I don't feel that it's a big deal. But and that's uh, up to you. What about the newspaper, the same idea? Like all a lot the of ink newspaper has newspaper. Soy soybean-based ink, so it's totally safe. And newspaper breaks down very rapidly. Okay. Even the colored papers. Colored papers, yep. Um, you know, if you're paranoid, if you want to do a completely organic garden and you're paranoid about it, it's, it's up to you what you want to put in it. But, um, but I don't, you know, the amount of ink on paper is pretty minimal. And especially newspapers are, are definitely safe. Um, at, at your work, do you shred the papers? Do you take home shredded paper ever from work? Because I know the extension office, you know, has bags of shredded paper that are available at least to master gardeners to take home and add to their compost piles. So a lot of places oh, okay. are doing that. Or is that something that you take home? And do you add shredded paper to your compost? I have yeah. added shredded paper. Um, I do have a, I also have a vermicompost, which I didn't talk about tonight because I, it would, I, could, I, took, I could talk another hour on vermicomposting. But um, that's basically indoor, you use red wiggler worms, which are not native to Iowa because they can't survive lower than 55 degrees, and they're soil dwellers, so they like to, they don't go deep down into the soil like earthworms do. Um, so they would die in, in the winters here. But uh, you keep them inside between like 55 and 75 degrees, and, um, and I just basically add a bunch of shredded paper to that and a little bit of food waste to that, and they, they go to town. Um, but the shredded paper, it's available at places, definitely. Um, I, I, do, I have taken some home from work, and I have a shredder at home, too. And I have added it to my pile in addition to leaves. That's another great thing to add to, to get those browns in there. Um, about your question about shredded paper and, and worms, we are, as part of this, I didn't talk about this initiative, but we are going to purchase worm kits. 
How exciting is that? Worm kits and then supply people with a starter number of red wrigglers. Right. So that will be in the in August. And again, there will be a, a cost for it, but a very minimal cost considering how much the worm kit costs. But Jen is our ace negotiator here and seems to be able to get good prices for um, all these kinds of initiatives that we have. So you'll be seeing more about that. So if you're interested in vermiculture, which is a lot of fun to say as well, we will have um, an initiative on that too. So thank you for, for bringing that up and get ready for worms in the fall because then you know they can live throughout the winter. They have to go into your home, but they're in a, a kit, a plastic kit. They're not going to escape. It'll be the safe. The thing about the red wigglers too is that they live to eat and reproduce and get rid of their waste. So it's perfect for composting because you start with a handful of worms and then if you feed them right, treat them right, then all of a sudden you've got, you know, 10 times as many. And you can't overpopulate because they only reproduce to the size of their container. So you can take some out, give them to a friend, and then it'll, they'll repopulate themselves. Have you heard of Trudy Temple? Do you, do you know who she is? No. We went to visit her, um, Project Green group went to visit her in um, Illinois. And she used to compost, and now what she does is digs what she calls Trudy Pits. And she just digs a pit right in her flower garden, and then as she weeds, everything just goes in this pit. And when it gets ground level, then she just fills it in with dirt, puts a rock on it, moves to another hole, and <laughs> starts over. And she shreds cardboard, she puts shredded paper, she puts all of her veggies and scraps, except, you know, the things that you mentioned that you shouldn't go in there. But the question I have is, um, you know, they claim that if you bury it, it produces methane. Is that true when, when you're doing that? Is that a problem? I don't know. Um, I know the landfill produces meth methane, which is essentially she's sort of doing a small-scale landfill. Um, I, I would say if she's just doing her own waste in her own yard, whatever, it's, it's going to be minimal, like very minimal, if it's producing anything. Is she covering it? Yes. She puts dirt on the top, and then she puts a big rock. And she said when the rock sinks down to the level of the ground, then it's ready to put a plant on there because it's, oh, all, okay. it's, it's just compost by that point. And that's, that's how she composts, which I've been doing that for a year or two um, before I even met Trudy because our neighbor used to go fishing, and she'd come home and bury her fish in her in her garden and um, I've been keeping my household garbage in ice cream buckets which tells you how much we like ice cream um, <laughs> but it works great because that seals pretty tight and it's not smelly yeah. um, and then when the buckets full I go out and I bury it in my garden during the year while I'm gardening I just between the rows and it's that's going great guns this year <laughs> and if, if you're burying it too you can get a little bit more you know creative with it. Um, well, I, I've heard of some, yes, about, you know, human waste and pet waste of a uh, farm of a family uh, that, I, I don't know them, I just heard the story, that they had their, you know, composting toilets like you've heard of, but they, that's the only thing that they used and then they would move it and they would use their own composted manure then to use for their garden to grow their food that they ate. So they really were doing that loop with their, yeah. A lot of people are kind of grossed out by that and wouldn't want to do it, but it can be done. Risa, if I may add to that too, ma'am, about your question, there's probably still enough oxygen getting into it, even in the ground, if she's, unless she's really packing it down and covering it, stomping it down with dirt. It's probably getting enough oxygen where it's not producing methane. Oh. Um, in the landfill, what we do is we compact everything and cover it daily with dirt or another cover. And so it's, there's no oxygen getting in. That's why the methane is produced. It's, the methane is produced when there's no oxygen present and it goes anaerobic. So it, that's so probably not actually, I, I, I would think that would be fine. I don't think it's probably, like Risa said, it's on such a small scale, it's probably still getting enough oxygen where it's not producing methane. That's my two cents. Cool. That's easy way to and you're keeping it out of the landfill and that's huge. Um, you talked about that you need to stir that, the compost bin, how, like once a week, or you just put in your garden fork um, and stir it? As or? little as never. Okay. And 
as, <laughs> and as often as you would like. You, you know, if you want to do a hot compost pile, you can do it in that machine. You can go out there and stir it every day or every, you know, twice a day. Keep an eye on the temperature of it. Um, you want to go out there and check it every day anyway if you're trying to do a hot compost pile just to make sure you're holding that temperature for the, like, for a couple weeks. Um, but if you don't really want to use it right away, if you want to just dump it in and let it do its thing, um, you don't really ever have to stir it. It'll, it's good to. If it starts to smell, um, it's good to throw some dry material in there and stir it up a little bit because part of that smell is coming from the nitrogen but also from the lack of air. So you want to, you know, stir, every time you stir it, it gives it more air movement. So um, I would say if you don't feel like doing much with it, throw your stuff in and when it starts to smell, stir it up a little bit and throw some brown stuff in there and, uh, and leave it. I stir mine um, in the spring when it starts to thaw. That's partly just picking at it to see if it's thawed yet. And uh, I stirred it really good probably in March and I haven't touched it since then. And if I feel ambitious later this summer, I might go out there in August or something and give it another really good stir. If, if I can just add, the, the earth machines come with a, is it 16 page? A, a little brochure or guide on how to do it. And you know, you can follow it or not follow it. It's up to you. And then we did prepare tonight, for tonight's program, a backyard composting resource list. And it's got, the library does have a good quantity of written material on composting. And some of it's sort of old, but composting really is pretty fundamental and hasn't changed, which is why if you look at these, the dates might surprise you. And then some new things. We have one video on composting, and then we also have some websites. So if you really want to explore more things than we're doing tonight, there are lots of um, opportunities. And if you didn't get a brochure or a handout, let me know. Is, are there more questions? Someone mentioned to me that when, if we compost, we will breed mosquitoes in that compost pile. Only if it's really wet. So keep Which it. Which it shouldn't, if you have it too wet, you know, mosquitoes like wet areas. Okay. Um, if you keep your compost pile as wet as a wrung out sponge, um, so then it, 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 won't, it won't smell, the worms will like it, and you shouldn't have a mosquito problem. So having it enclosed with the lid will that help does you help. manage um, that. Flies might be a problem. Um, I, mine gets a lot of fruit flies. Mine's not covered, which is fine for me. The only problem I have with it not being covered is that my cat likes to go on top of it and look down at all the things crawling around, and then she jumps on it. So then she comes in the house and she smells like compost. Um, <laughs> but you, um, you really don't have mosquito. I haven't had a mosquito problem. Um, if you do have flies or any other bugs on it, throw some leaves on top, should take care of it, or shredded paper. On Saturday, if we're interested in getting those, do we need to bring anything that shows that we're an Iowa City resident? Just a driver's license yes, is enough? Yeah. Okay. And then my other question was, where did you get the first one that you keep with the filters in it for inside the house? Um, but that was a wedding present. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually bought one for my mother-in-law. It's, um, I think they're around 30 or $40. Uh, I got it online. I just searched for compost container or uh, yes oh new has them okay great even better and I think Lennox and Selig does too they're okay they're not all that that difficult to find I don't I don't know if they come in any size if you if they do I would personally get one smaller because there's just two of us and but, the, what do you do with the filter um, you're supposed to um, swap them out for new filters um, like every six months or something I don't I when, if they start to get really nasty looking or if, the, if it does start to smell, then it's time for a new filter. You can buy replacement filters. They come in a two-pack, and it takes two of them. Um, if you're going to ask me if you can compost them, I, maybe. I'm does not it, sure. Does anybody know? Can you compost? No, can't. I think you can. I, it, would say, it would say on the package if you can or not, I, but I think... I think you can. We do also compost. Um, we have fish tanks, and we use charcoal in, in those. We, we compost that. So. Charcoal. Compost what? 
The charcoal that you use in your fish tank filters. Do you have any suggestions if you have a small yard as far as how far away from your house you should put it for any odors and that kind of thing? Um, or yeah. small yard attached to neighbor's yards, you know, really close by. But. So if you, when you're trying to figure out where to put your compost bin in your yard, mine is on the opposite end of the yard, um, up against the neighbor's fence, but that's kind of where their compost is too. Uh, it's a little bit of a walk for me to go and dump it. So it both depends on how far you want to walk and so that you know you're going to actually go out there and dump it. Um, and you, don't, you probably don't want to put it right up against your house because if it does start to smell um, and you add the brown material to it, it might take it a couple days to stop smelling or a day to stop smelling. So um, a little bit away from the house is what I would suggest and as far away from the house as you feel comfortable walking. I mean, I compost year round, so if you don't want to, you know, walk through snow banks to get to it, I wouldn't do it too far away. But it's, it's entirely up to you. It's sort of, you know, you just got to look around your yard and think, where am I willing to walk and how far? You don't want to put it right underneath your kitchen window if you have your window open all summer long. Um, oh, I just wanted to say for, for, for your benefit that I have um, a compost bins, I have six compost <laughs> piles and stuff, such but I have a compost bin similar to this and and I one year it was like just right outside my back door across my driveway and I, I didn't ever have an odor from it you know if you put the right things in and even I didn't really pay at that time I didn't pay much attention to what I was putting in I mean I knew what not to put in but I never had an odor from it or bugs around it or anything. Yeah, but you're a master gardener. No, I wasn't then. Oh, okay. I, that was in the <laughs> beginning. That was very in the very, you know, I mean, it's just been the last couple of years that I've done the gardening, but I've composted for a long time and okay. I didn't have a problem. Okay. And the thing is, it might stink, but you know what to do to keep it from stinking and you know what to do now to keep, if it does. Just a short question. Would you include eggshells? Absolutely. Eggshells are wonderful. So even though, you know, they are related to chickens, et cetera, meat, whatever, well, chickens, it doesn't matter. That's not meat. Yeah. That, okay. Well, you don't want to put the egg in there because then you'll get rotten egg smell. So um, I've actually, I hard boil eggs a lot. And if, if you get the shell stuck to the egg, you know, like I usually do, um, I don't use that because there's quite a bit of egg still attached to the shell. But... For the most part, um, eggshells are a wonderful thing to compost, um, and whether you want to crush them or not, they'll break down faster if they're crushed, but they'll still break down if they're not. They just add wonderful nutrients to the compost. Um, uh, well, the city has specific regulations about how far away from your house and your neighbor's house the compost bin has to be, which is kind of why I was like, well, where do I put the compost bin? It would have to be like the middle of my backyard. Or something like that. Are I mean, you asking if the city has regulations? No, they do, definitely. It's oh, okay. I learned something. I had no idea. <laughs> Middle center. Um, no less than 20 feet from a house. And five feet from a property boundary line. Okay, well, I'm breaking that rule, but so is my backyard neighbor that I'm breaking it with, so we're okay. <laughs> and it shouldn't be located in a drainage way or in an area between a building and the street right of way. So these brochures are handy. <laughs> Any other questions? Do you have directions to get to the, which building when we get out to the, on Saturday? When you go to Restore, where do you go? Um, does everyone know where Restore is? It's on Scott Boulevard. You, uh, if you take Highway 6 to Scott Boulevard, it's, it's not very far from Highway 6. And it's, they've got a big sign, too, that says Restore. Is it before the railroad tracks? Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's on the But when you, when you drive in, the, the building is on the right, and there's some recycled um, containers on the left. 
Um, you just go in the, the store? Well, actually, the three of us will be there Saturday in a big tent selling the, the compost bin. So oh, okay. look for us in the white tent. And then after Saturday, are they just, you go into the store? Yeah, after Saturday, you can just go directly into the store. I have a hunch that they may sell out on Saturday, but I'm an optimist, so we'll see. Okay. Anyway. Any other questions? Anybody have a, any questions about Eco Iowa City that we can answer? Well, oh, you do. Hang on, just a sec. Can I can talk about Okay, talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't until next year. Correct, correct. Can you hang on that long? I'm, 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 I'm going to go buy one, but I'll wait for the other one. So. There'll be a drought next year. Yeah, exactly. Hmm? <laughs> My neighbor will buy a yeah, it, We've had lots and lots and lots of questions about rain barrels. It seems to be a very popular topic. And so we'll have a, a workshop like this next spring, and we hope to have a, a test rain garden and what we really like to do is a rain garden tour, but I think the Backyard Abundance Tour this Saturday, they have um, yes. rain gardens. So if you want to see how that works, you can take a look at that this summer and get ready for next summer. But it won't be till next year. But the red, rig red wrigglers, that'll be this fall, so you can get even more ready. I'm, I'm just thinking, like she said, that there's a drought next year. Now, is it in the spring? Yes. So we can take advantage of our buffer Yes. Yes. And those, they're uh, 55 gallons typically. They, they'll fill up in one rain event. Okay. Um, yeah. Did you have something to say, add to it? No, I was just going to. Well, you mentioned the rain barrel, and I was just going to make a plug for Orsland's. They got really cheap ones for 30 bucks. Yes. If, you're, if you're handy, you can add some like extra little faucets and stuff to it. That's what I did with ours. And, but that's a good way. They got fancier ones in Menards, too. Um, Orschlands, it's on Highway 6 near Kmart. Yeah. yeah. And we added a, um, that's my husband, we added a rain cat, or catch to the, so the leaves and debris coming in from the gutter doesn't go into the rain barrel. Um, it didn't come with that, so that's a good thing if you're going to, if you're going to get one of those to make sure it has something. You can make your own, I guess. Really, at the cheese factory. The trouble is, I haven't figured out how to get the rain into the barrel because it's just got one little hole like this, and unless I find a way to cut off the lid and then put You have to get some there. tools, yeah. I've heard that panning hose work as a very nice filter to keep mosquitoes from, if they do get in, they can't get out, and oh. it keeps them out, so. Huh. For those of you who don't worry about it. <laughs> And we are in the process of building a rain garden at my house right now, so. Uh. Yeah, I, I bought my rain barrel at the cheese factory. So it's a fi regular 55 gallon drum. I put mine on the side. Oh yeah? So that, and did some plumbing to go in the top hole for the water coming in and then the spigot out to the second hole. $5 for the barrel, $50 for the plumbing. Yeah. <laughs> How does the rain get into the barrel? It goes down a pipe. It just ran a pipe from the downspout. downspout with a three inch white uh, plug. And used a, what kind of an elbow? You know, a, a Y shaped uh -huh. connector. Oh. So you're actually <laughs> shooting it right into the barrel. You can go to my Facebook and I'll show you a picture. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do we, <laughs> speaking of Facebook, um, Eco Iowa City does have a Facebook page, so you can all become our friends. Just look under Eco Iowa City. And so the activities that we're going to have will be posted on there, and we'll try and get the links to the items we distributed tonight up on the library's website and on the Facebook website. So you can look at those things because there are some, some good ideas. And if you have, if you become our friend, which I know you will, you can post ideas, because I think this is, what we'd really like to do is have some kind of a forum, and 
you know, you guys, a lot of you obviously know what you're doing, and people always want someone to, to share their experiences with them, whether they're positive or negative, or how they can do something less expensively, or, or how they can make something better. So do look at our Facebook page, Eco Iowa City, and join if you're interested. And um, I think we'll wrap it up tonight, but I'd really like to thank Risa for that wonderful presentation. And this program will air again on Channel 10, the library's um, public access station. And so you'll be able to see yourself probably far in the future, looking <laughs> like you do in 2009. And we will add it to the library's collection, so it will circulate. And if you, have people, if you know people who are interested in composting and they didn't come tonight, please share with them that the compost bins will be available beginning on Saturday at Restore. And we have marvelous compost at the landfill. And it doesn't matter where you live, you can go to the landfill and get it. It's very, very inexpensive. And it is taking the yard waste from our yards and turning it back into soil. So I encourage you to use that as well. And um, even though we'll finish now, if you have questions for Jen about the recycling or the landfill, or you'd like to talk to Risa, or you'd just like to stay and share information with each other, please do. So thank you again for coming. And we hope to um, see you at more of our programs, particularly the rain barrel one in rain gardens, because it sounds like there's lots and lots of interest for that. So stay cool. Thanks again for coming. <laughs>